Am plăcerea în seara aceasta și astăzi, la un an de la prima noastră conferință, aproape un an, să-l avem ca invitat pe dr. Cristian Schwaderer de la Universitatea din Tübingen. Acum este o poveste drăguță, faptul, felul în care ne-am cunoscut. Am fost amândoi, să zicem, studenți la Maynooth University, la departamentul de Digital Humanities, invitat de către cea care a ținut prima conferință acum un an, profesorul Susan Schreibman, care îi suntem, bineînțeles, datori amândoi pentru că am putut să ne specializăm în diversele domenii ale uh, lui Digital Humanities. Uh, așa că, so, what I said. <laughs> I introduced you and I mentioned that we were colleagues at uh, Maynooth University yeah. and that we had a great time there yeah. and uh, hope to go back. Uh, I didn't say that in many but <laughs> okay. Um, so please allow me to um, um, present you briefly uh, some slides with our uh, activity uh, in this first year of uh, existence. Uh, but uh, you have to know that uh, we started working at the center in 2014 when we began to, to meet. Uh, with different uh, colleagues uh, uh, in, from the center who are now um, founding members. Uh, and um, it was a long process. It's not easy to create uh, a center in uh, our university. Uh, and I think that's because the field is very uh, peculiar. Um, it's a field that uh, exists in other countries um, already for, I don't know, 20 years or, or something like that, but it's a uh, benefic, um, I don't know, marriage, if you want, between uh, humanities and uh, the, um, the IT and the, um, how to say, the practical side of, uh, of the science, of science. Uh, so, I will go to the computer and show you some uh, slides of our activity. Uh, okay, where is the camera? <laughs> so, this, uh, acestea sunt imagini de la uh, prima conferință, uh, lansarea centrului uh, Digital Humanities. Uh, când am avut-o editată pe, pe, pe profesorul Susan Schreiben, uh, ea fiind o somitate în, în, în domeniu uh, și este directorul Institutului Alfora Sfeasa de la Menut uh, University. Ei se ocupă cu digitizarea patrimoniului uh, cultural irlandez și în special cu un proiect extraordinar la care lucrează aproape întreaga Irlandă și care se numește Letters of 1916. Este un proiect foarte mare, care bineînțeles se va termina acum în 1916. Dorința noastră ar fi să găsim și noi un astfel de, de subiect, mai ales că peste trei ani vom avea și noi o aniversare și ar fi bine dacă toată lumea s-ar uni și am, am lucrat la un proiect de genul acesta. Noi încercăm să facem ceva, încă nu vă spunem, dar sperăm că vom reuși. Da, este în această sală, Susan Schreiber și auditorul. După aceea, eu și cu Irina am fost invitate să participăm la un workshop, Multimodal Communication, Resources and Application, la Universitatea din, din Debrecen unde am învățat lucruri foarte, foarte interesante. După cum vedeți, Digital Humanities are, este o, putem spune ca o umbrelă, deci acoperă foarte multe domenii de studiu, inclusiv acesta al comunicării. După aceea am fost la Cluj Innovation Day, aici îi vedeți pe colegii noștri care sunt în sală, Leo și Alina. Așa. Domnul Alexandru Dulai și Andrei Kelemen de la uh, clusterul Cluj IT, cu care am colaborat și sperăm să colaborăm în continuare. Uh, 
Apoi am avut o invitată pe Julia Nihan, care este profesor în Digital Humanities la Universitatea UCL, University College of London. Așa. Iar pe urmă, cu ajutorul acestei organizații, NEDIMA, care însemna Network in Arts and Humanities, am avut un, un grant și am uh, reușit să organizăm acest workshop în TEI. TEI este un, un limbaj, o codificare, mai ales pentru, o să vă vorbească Cristian despre, despre TEI, codificarea uh, textelor după ce acestea au fost digitizate. Adică ce înseamnă digitizate? Noi spunem digitizat la scanat, dar nu este. Deci digitizarea presupune un, un proces mult mai uh, complex. Iar aici, dragii noștri colegi, învățau de zor diverse tehnici de digitizare. Am avut trei uh, trainer de la Maynooth University uh, și de la uh, Trinity College. Da. Uh, după cum vedeți, toată lumea învăța. Uh, de exemplu, cum se codifică o uh, capsa poștală. Echipam. Am avut și uh, bursieri, uh, Maria Segan de la, din, din Serbia și Nic Constantinescu din, uh, din București. Așa. Uh, uh, bun. Uh, mai departe, o colegă de-a noastră a fost uh, prezentă la uh, Manchester University. Uh, o puteți vedea doar așa în reflexie. Uh, My Friend. My Friend a fost uh, primul nostru uh, proiect în care am participat ca uh, parteneri. Uh, am avut plăcerea să o uh, numim din partea noastră uh, pe uh, Rusandra uh, Bulacă, care este și șef al Departamentului de Cercetare Dezvoltare în centrul nostru și care ne-a reprezentat cu cinste, sper, în acest proiect. Bun. Am coorganizat un colocviu împreună cu PSPAC în mai 2015. La fel am avut invitat pe un personaj foarte interesant, nu știu dacă ați auzit de el, se numește uh, Cezar Popescu Ia, și el a digitizat uh, niște uh, fotografii uh, care îi aparțin lui Co uh, Costica Axinte. Costica Axinte a fost un fotograf în Slobozia și el a fotografiat în, în drag, între, draga societate a orașului Slobozia, uh, cred că de la sfârșitul celui de-a doua mondial până prin anii 70. Ori aceste filme, care de fapt erau pe sticlă, au fost aruncate într-o într cameră. Iar uh, Cezar Popescu le-a găsit și le-a uh, digitizat. Este o colecție extraordinar de frumoasă, o puteți găsi pe, uh, pe internet. Deci l-am avut invitat. Uh, acesta este cartea lui. Uh, după aceea, colegele noastre uh, mai tinere, Gabi și cu voi ca ne-au ne reprezentat la uh, eventul final al acestei rețele uh, NEDIMA, care nu mai funcționează acum uh, și care s-a desfășurat la uh, University of London. Vedeți ce bine se simțea? Da? Uh, așa? Uh, aceasta este University of London, I suppose. Da? Bun. Am avut încă o conferință, dr. Ioan Stan, uh, care uh, uh, ne-a vorbit despre uh, patentele din, mă rog, dânsul lucrează cu Uniunea Europeană sau pentru... A. Uh, de asemenea, colega noastră a participat la o întâlnire europeană la Amsterdam, unde am învățat diverse tehnici de vizualizare a uh, periodicelor deja digitizate. Am participat la diverse conferințe organizate de către mediul IT, cum ar fi Texilvania, 
sau uh, Irina a participat la uh, Digital Humanities Experiments uh, organizat de Institutul German din Paris uh, la Paris. Aici este o fotografie foarte frumoasă cu uh, Irina și cu cei care sunt uh, îndrăgostiți ca și noi de Digital Humanities sau cum spun francezii le zimanite numerică. Uh, by the way, eu sunt profesor de franceză. Așa, o artă participare în Cluj la o activitate organizată de Orange și colega noastră, Alexandra, a participat la școala de vară în Digital Humanities, care este una dintre cele mai mari școli de vară din Europa, cea de la Leipzig. Alexandra a participat la două. Ediția a primit bursă, o bursă destul de bună, și în 2014 și în 2015 și poate la merge și anul acesta. <laughs> da. Uh, și acestea sunt fotografiile. Aici ce făceai, ai vede? Verificai dioptriile? <laughs> da, dar la debet, în continuarea workshop-ului Martin o altă participare. Aceasta este de la Maynard University, unde am fost două luni în Visiting Fellow, iar aceștia sunt colegii, o parte din colegii de acolo. Am, împreună cu, cu Cristian, am participat la un curs de 3D. Deci a fost o experiență extraordinară. Trebuie spus că colegii noștri de la Maynard University au o aparatură fantastică printre altele, o, o, o imprimantă și un scanner hiperspectral. Deci este un, un scanner care vede tot. <laughs> uh, și ar fi bine să avem și noi, dacă costă enorm, aproape 100 de mii de euro sau mai mult de atât, uh, și pe care ei l-au folosit la descifrarea scrisorilor din 1916. Ori noi uh, l-am folosit, am învățat să lucrăm cu el. Aici am ținut eu o conferință uh, la Maynard University, uh, biblioteca din Maynard University. Desigur uh, că, de timp, o parte din noi am scris diverse articole uh, pe care le-am publicat în diverse uh, locuri uh, și, uh, să zicem, bonus, dar poate nu e chiar bonus, poate e un lucru foarte important, de faptul că eu personal am reușit să introduc un curs la masterul francofon, deocamdată, de uh, introducere în Digital Humanities, care va începe în 2016-2017. În uh, și uh, proiectele noastre, uh, cele de care vă putem vorbi, vă dați seama că avem și proiecte secrete, uh, sunt în aceste domenii. Mapping Literature, Digitizing, Amnesia, Kids, Manuscript, Data Visualization. Uh, și acesta este, acesta este ziua în care uh, am aflat că centrul nostru a fost acreditat de către uh, Senatul UVB în, uh, nu chiar în unanimitate, era cu majoritate de, uh, de, de voturi. Bun, deci cam asta a fost activitatea noastră pe 2015. Și sper să începem anul, adică începem anul în, în forță cu uh, conferința lui Cristian. Cristian, I, I know you understood everything I said. No, absolutely not. <laughs> okay, so I will introduce you now uh, Christian Schwader, who is a historian of medieval history. Uh, he is mostly interested in historiography and also a digital humanist. He uh, recently published a digital edition of a medieval Latin chronicle of the mid-20th century. Uh, this project was founded by the German Research Foundation. Other important publication could be his dissertation on attitudes towards technology, material change and innovation between 1500 and uh, 1000 AD. Uh, and his database of the letters of Pope Gregory the Seventh. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for um, introducing me, Corinna. So, uh, we will change presentation. Okay, here we are. 
Uh, well, um, first things first, uh, uh, first whenever you um, don't understand me, uh, for uh, whatever reasons, uh, just wave your hand and uh, try to um, explain what I uh, try to say. So I'm going to talk about a very old uh, question. I think the question is uh, basically as old as digital humanities uh, themselves. What technical skills does um, humanists uh, have to have in order to do digital humanities? I don't think I will really um, contribute to this uh, discussion here. I will just um, yeah, give my personal um, experience and what worked for me and um, yeah, maybe what didn't. So, um, in my opinion, doing a digital um, scholarly um, edition is um, mono, one of, might be one of the most um, difficult um, tasks um, in the field um, because you don't have to be a, a leading expert in any field, but you have to have a, a working knowledge in um, many fields. And this is um, part of it uh, I'm going to um, show you um, in this um, talk. It will be quite uh, technical, um, so um, don't feel shocked if I uh, show some source code or something like that. Um, just don't worry. Okay, we will um, start with two um, basic um, concepts in uh, digital humanities, especially and also in um, technology, what's over. First thing is um, XML. Maybe you have heard of it. I'll just uh, give you a, um, a very short uh, introduction into it. It's a way of encoding um, data, data, whatever data, but especially um, suitable um, for uh, text-based um, documents. Um, it looks like um, such. Um, you can name your um, elements, um, whatever you, you want, um, and of attributes, and um, you can um, nest um, those elements. So it's quite flexible um, way to encode um, data, and um, maybe it's a uh, too flexible, so this is why for um, do, doing um, something with, which might be of use for other people, you have to have some kind of a standard. And this standard for the um, humanities, especially for encoding texts, is um, what the so-called uh, text encoding initiative uh, did. Um, this definition is my definition, so I define TI as a set of rules for um, applying those um, or um, for using um, special elements so that you don't name them some element but in a special way and also some attributes and rules for, for nesting them and arranging them and so on and so on. So um, the important point here is um, to, keep, to keep in mind when, when thinking about a digital um, edition that um, the layout, I'm also going to talk um, about that, comes right at the end while um, at first, you uh, do um, semantic markup or descriptive um, encoding. That's uh, basically the, the same uh, thing. So what, what do I mean by this? Um, imagine you have this um, sentence in a book, and uh, you want to encode it um, scholarly. So um, the question arises, what, what do you do? When I mean, just typing, typing in um, such things in a word processor like Microsoft Word, um, you don't have to do anything. There is no structure in this sentence, there is no layout, nothing to do. However, when you do semantic encoding, you, should, you could maybe do something like this. P means just a paragraph and don't worry that I omitted some, some words, but the point is that here one of five is actually a Latin expression, so you can mark that this is a foreign element inside the English sentence coming from the Latin, and A means uh, Latin, and then afterwards you can filter out every Latin uh, sentence or, or word or snippet or whatever. Um, and maybe this won't, won't be you to do, but um, somebody in, in 200 years will find it useful that uh, someone 200 years ago did uh, mark all Latin expressions inside English text for whatever purpose. So this is, after all, the idea of um, semantic encoding. You know, it could, or you, you can imagine, it could be very time-consuming to do so, but I think it's, yeah, it's, it's worth uh, doing it. So having that said about um, the, yeah, the basics, I will um, talk now a little bit about um, my own digital um, edition, and as every um, digital or every classic edition or every scholarly edition, it starts with a transcription. Um, so I won't talk here about the, the historic um, 
um, background of the text and also not about it, the text uh, itself, but, but one just, just wanted to show you one um, example of the, the manuscript I had to deal with. So, the first, um, just first a few lines um, you see here above, um, do in the code uh, look um, like this. So, if you see something like this for the first time, um, it might seem um, complicated. However, I can, can tell you that um, you can learn it rather quickly, and when it comes to doing a digital edition, this is actually the easiest technical part. So, um, what do we do here? Um, by annotating and tagging, in my opinion, we add value. Let me give you one um, example. What, what uh, I, I did here is expanding all abbreviations. For example, um, yeah, probably you, you can't read it, but uh, that doesn't matter here. You say you see uti na, and then you have this kind of a dash um, above the a, and this is an, in Latin an abbreviation for uti nam with an m. And what I did here is say, okay, this is what's what's in the manuscript, and this is what it means. So I add additional value, which is not in the original text, but which is added by interpretation by me. So, and also there are other elements like, like structural elements, like this TI high means that it's some, somehow highlighted. You see, okay, uh, it's obvious that it's highlighted, like a big D here, and so on and so on and so on. So, but I won't talk here about uh, um, um, doing the, the Tremere to an inscription, but um, well, the next question uh, arises if, if, when you are doing um, something like this is how can you ensure that what you encode is actually correct? Well, this um, has two uh, aspects uh, ensuring data quality. Um, the first one is that you, uh, the consistency of the structure is um, correct. Sticking with this uh, example, I decided for me um, that every single abbreviation has to be expanded by me. Um, this is not standard um, TI. In, in standard uh, TI, it says just uh, you can do it, but uh, you can also omit it. It's completely up uh, to you, which is uh, a good thing that TI is, is flexible. But however, um, if you uh, want, want to use um, a document for, for whatever purpose, it's, it's quite a good thing to have uh, the, the, the structure consistent so that you don't mix up different styles of um, encoding. Well, there is a, a solution for this, but uh, this already needs um, some, um, some coding. It look, looks like such. I won't go uh, into detail here. You see it's just a, a few lines um, which may, make sure that, that your, your data um, is valid in, in um, this case, that uh, every single um, abbreviation um, is expanded. So it's just, just a few lines, and it's not, not complicated. However, um, in order to have a... Um, a well-structured document, you should know what to do here. Um, of course, if, if it uh, was just uh, this, um, this sing single rule, you, you can, um, of course, um, remember it by heart, but uh, in reality, it will be like uh, 100 uh, rules, and then you, you can't simply uh, rem remember them all, um, all at once. So, but this is just one aspect of um, data um, quality. The other is, of course, the accuracy of the data itself, that what you are trans transcribing is actually what's in the manuscript. It uh, doesn't make any sense if your, your uh, document is complete, consistent, but it uh, contains just nonsense. So what I did was um, I um, created a kind of a preview um, for myself. Um, Theoretically, it, it's, it's possible to, to do um, a transcription by just looking at a TI code and then um, afterwards uh, correct it just again looking at the TI code. Um, but I think that, uh, or, uh, or um, yeah, just, just uh, two days after I, I started my, uh, my transcription, I, I um, decided that it's not, not enough to, to look at the code because that it's, yeah, can be, uh, even if you're familiar with it, a little bit confusing because you have those elements and those attributes and so on and so on. So I decided that a clear, and um, clean uh, view um, would be more um, useful for, for comparing my transcription with the manuscript. And um, at that point, I had to start to do some transformation work and again to um, do some code work. 
you see it's, it's um, again not, not very uh, very many uh, lines of code but again there is some code and um, in order to, to have a, um, a preview um, for yourself you have to know which lines of code to write so and this is um, the result I got you see um, there are no no um, TI codes here just, just just a clean view and then I could could uh, compare it um, with the manuscript pages I'm, I'm, I'm uh, quite sure that this uh, improved the quality of the data because many um, mistakes uh, were, were found uh, when looking at this um, preview. But then afterwards I decided that this is still um, not enough, that something like this um, might be even more handy, um, a comparison line by line. One line of the manuscript, one line of the transcription, and this way it's quite, quite easy to, to see if, if some some words were omitted or are, are spelled uh, in the wrong way or even that didn't happen but even you, you would see if, an, if, if there was a word which is not actually in the manuscript but was in, invented uh, maybe by a drunken uh, transcriber or something like that. So, how did I um, achieve that? Well, at this, this point it really got uh, complicated. Um, we're just, just look, looking at... Um, uh, this, this, this preview line by line, you, you won't think that it's uh, so complicated, but uh, indeed it, it was. So what I did was I wrote a, an XSLT template which, which counted all the lines in each uh, folio. So um, in, in modern books, there are the, the name of uh, the number of lines are usually a fixed, a fixed layout. Usually you have in, in modern books, but uh, um, in uh, medieval manuscript, of course, that's not not the case. So in order to have the, the, the correct um, amount of files um, to use, I had to, to, to count the lines um, and then um, I had to write um, all of, of the, the numbers into an exchange uh, file format, in this case uh, JSON um, and then I use another programming language um, because in, with XSLT you, you can do many things with, with XML but nothing on the, almost nothing on the, um, on the file system so I used another um, programming uh, language um, to, to copy the files for, for each page um, the, uh, in the amount of, uh, of lines in it and of course um, name it in a, in a um, certain way so that, can, that I uh, could, could use it and at this point um, I decided to, um, to do the rest of the work uh, manually of course it could be possible to do it um, with a um, um, kind, kind of script with, with um, line recognition but that would be very very um, difficult so at this, this point I decided to do it manually and this is what yeah, what, what was the outcome and, and from this it's um, yeah, rather easy but, but not, not very smooth um, to get um, yeah, to, get a, a, to, to create a source code like this and from this um, yeah, you then the, the preview so very long process just just to have those those um, line by line um, views and this again helped me to, to find some some mistakes in the in, in the data there were quite a, quite a lot of uh, mistakes with which I and uh, also my, my student assistant uh, found there so it was worth the, um, the, the the work but yeah it's it's complicated so um, just just a few other examples of um, ensuring um, data quality with uh, technical tricks. Um, usually, um, a Latin text um, is shorter than its um, German equivalent. And I did also a German translation for my Latin text. And one way to um, to make sure that I didn't um, omit something in the in the translation. I wrote a, a very small uh, function with, which gave me all um, paragraphs in which the Latin text was actually longer than the German one and in all of them there were some omissions. So this was a way to control my um, translation. Another example might be when, when doing the critical apparatus um, you have all those, those um, variants in, in, um, in an element and then you can say okay just, just give me the variants of one single, um, in this, this case, um, an early modern print edition, and then compare it again with the original one. It's quite, quite complicated if you have a classical um, text apparatus and then you always have to, to check the variants. Um, it's uh, easier to have it in the, in the text without an apparatus. Um, also, it helps to, to find uh, typos, and uh, especially if you tag 
person names and place names, which is a good practice uh, anyway to have them um, tagged. And if, if you do so, you can uh, get a distinct values and you will find um, typos in it. Give me, let, uh, let me give you a fictive um, example. This, this text is uh, complete nonsense. It's not, not uh, even a, a, a language which uh, existed. Um, do you see where the typo is in the, in the name? Probably you don't. Um, but if you uh, write a, a small function with, which gives you the distinct values of each person name, then you might get something like this, and then you will see that uh, in, in one occurrence there is an I here, and above there isn't, and probably one of it uh, is, a, is a typo. So um, if you have 100 uh, occurrences of, of this, this particular name, you, you won't, won't see any typos, but if you, you get a distinct value, so you will just, just have two or three of them, and um, probably, um, yeah, in one there is a typo. So as a first uh, conclusion, um, I would say that um, it's absolutely crucial, even at this early uh, state of um, just, just checking your own transcription, to have um, technical skills um, oneself. Um, yeah, of course, if I had uh, someone in, in my team with, with uh, very good uh, technical skills, I could have um, given him or her those um, tasks. Um, yeah. The practical point is that I didn't uh, had uh, that someone, um, but the, from a theoretical level, I think um, it's it's um, very much more complicated to, to explain each of, of those tasks. Like write me a function with give, with, which gives me that uh, that uh, data or that data or something like that. Um, I think you would lose very much time in, in communication and, and this discussing and so on and so on. And it's more efficient um, if just one person does that all, so then um, nothing is lost in um, communication. So, um, yeah, just don't, don't mind about these uh, abbreviations if you don't know them. Just, just want, want to list up what, what, what technologies are used for data, um, um, ensuring data um, quality. So, but till now I only talked about um, checking your data and not about yeah, the turning your data into something which might be of any, any use to non-technicians. Uh, so um, after all, you want to have a kind of a presentation and this is also not quite um, straightforward or at least in my experience it's not quite straightforward but a little bit, um, yeah, we will see. So many people will tell you um, that it works like this. You have now your perfectly encoded data, um, for example, in XML, TI, or whatever. Then you decide uh, on the layout, and then you get a presentation, for example, or usually in uh, HTML, this is uh, the, the format in which uh, normal web pages are encoded. So basically, many people think that um, the task is uh, something like this. Um, you have this um, yeah, TI snippet, uh, P for paragraph in, in Latin or whatever. Then you decide uh, which font to use, and that's it. Um, however, the reality is more complex, and this is um, what I'm going to show you in the next uh, few minutes. Um, this is a screenshot or um, yeah, a mixture of several screenshots uh, of my um, edition. I won't talk about the, um, the content here, so probably you, you can't uh, read the, the Latin and the German, but never mind, it's not the point here. The point is, um, I want to, to point you to, to one, one single phenomenon, so to say, and this is the, the links herein. There are, um, if you think about it, quite a few um, categories of links. This, this above are navigation links, of course. Then we have links to commentary entries um, um, in two ways, from the, um, from the heading here and from the normal text, so to say. And this is um, yeah, a complicated um, case. Um, then you have links to the apparatus bibliography, like Codex and um, the, the, the print editions, which uh, already existed. And um, there is an index of, of places here, like Einheim, and also of um, people, which are not here in, but yeah, they exist anyway. And um, of course, there is the normal um, 
bibliography, like um, for this, this um, professor who wrote an important article here. So, of course, you can do that all uh, hard uh, coded, and it takes only time. Then it's technically absolutely easy to do all those links by hand. However, it takes um, much time. And if you do decide to do it in an automatic way, it takes probably less time, but it gets uh, complicated. And this is um, what I'm going to show you now. Um, I mean, thinking about um, the, how the links uh, might be referenced in your original data, then maybe it becomes clear why it's so problematic. For example, a reference to a uh, bibliography entry might look um, like this. So you see that you just uh, have the, the, the page number, um, this, this means a page, um, and some kind of a paragraph number or whatever, and um, some kind of a technical pointer. In this, this case, it's the, the uh, oh, oh, sorry, I was on the wrong screen with the, with the mouse here. This is um, some kind of a technical um, pointer. However, what you don't want to have here is the actual, um, the actual reference you want to use in, in the text. So you only want to use uh, um, um, those pointers to have the possibility to decide at one point um, whether you will um, use um, some kind of uh, referencing like Brixis 1999 or with a, a short title or what, whatever. If you do decide to, to hard code it, um, this uh, inside uh, the reference elements, um, then in case you want to change it later, you have to, to change every single occurrence. Um, so and this is quite inefficient. So you want to have a function which decides at one um, point which, um, which way to use. And this is just for bibliography um, links. If you think about uh, person names, in this case, um, that's, these are not typos, but these are real uh, forms of Jesus Christ in medieval Latin. So, if you want to um, build a um, index of all the names, then of course you don't want, want to have all those those um, um, those um, yeah silly forms. You want to have one canonical uh, form um, in the um, in the index. However, in, in the text, of course, you want want to keep those. Um, those forms as they are, because this is what it is in the manuscript. So we have to have a, a switch between the, uh, um, two, um, two cases for this um, yeah, simple person index. And um, if you think about references to the source text themselves, you can do it in two ways. Either you can um, use the words themselves, uh, like in the introduction, you mention one, one uh, important sentence and you, you quote it uh, word by word, and you want to have the words themselves. But, but sometimes if you want to point uh, from the introduction to the text just, just by um, the paragraph number, like uh, there are quite a few paragraphs in which, and then uh, you open the brackets like paragraph number, whatever, 2, 12, 20, whatever. Um, but then, in this, this case, you want to um, ensure that you, you stick with a certain, certain numbering system, of course, and uh, what you also don't want to do is do that, uh, the counting manually, but you want to have a, a function for that. Well, and these are just, just a few cases to, to show you that um, in your data already the problem starts because you, something you don't want to do in your data you want to decide later on it. And uh, these are just one, um, just a few cases. You also have um, um, references, of course, to chapter of introduction, FAQ sections, commentary entries, and so on and so on. I won't go um, into detail here. So the plan for an XSLT template um, might look like such. For just for the content of links, you have very many cases you want to, uh, your, or you have to, um, you have to program, like in this case, do this, in this case, do this, in this case, do this, and, and so on and so on. However, till now, it looks um, feasible. Um, or at least I found it was uh, feasible. The problem for me really started when I realized um, that there are not, not just, uh, yeah, the problem is not just the content of the, of the link, on, but, but what you see it as text of the link, but uh, the technical target of the link. So, 
till now I thought, okay, uh, no, it, it doesn't, doesn't really uh, sound so easy if you think that you uh, want to link to elements which are not directly in the source data. So, um, at the begin beginning of my talk, I talked about the transcription with, with the, um, the pictures in it and uh, without the pictures in it. And of course, this is not encoded in your data, like uh, you, you copy your, your transcription and you add once the, the pictures. This is what happens um, in the processing. So you want to, to um, so I had to, to point to, to things which were not directly in, in the data, one, one, one transcription with images and one without images. Um, and I had to, to find a solution for, for this, um, this, this problem. Um, yeah, and you, you remember that I said you have to encode it in a semantic way. You, just, you can't just do it like, um, like it fits uh, in the, um, and for, for the technical side. You have to have, uh, stick with the semantic way of uh, encoding. And this is just one example. Another uh, example might be that the commentary entries are split up because there are the, the comments are so many of them into different different pages, and uh, this happens of course uh, while processing them. So when when you set a link um, inside your document to a commentary entry, you don't know yet on which uh, which page it will be uh, in the result. So this um, was a little bit of a, a problem um, for me as well, and also the DI XML file itself. I, I um, Want to? Yeah, you, you can actually download it if you are interested in it. Uh, you can download it, but in order to make sure um, that this this happens, I had to find a way of um, um, including uh, including a, a link to something which which you can't can't link from from your data because there is no no element for the file itself in, in XML. So um, long story short, in a um, on a more abstract level. Links mean don't just just simple links, but it means you have to have uh, a function for the link content, for the link target, on uh, two different levels and uh, linking from from um, each other. So something, some uh, things are um, added um, um, not not uh, in the data level, but on the presentation level. I will uh, talk about it in a few uh, seconds. So this is on a more abstract level that the problem just. With links, some, something which which which, which uh, is it, it seems so simple when looking at a website, but in reality it's yeah more complicated. So that um, this is just the um, the the template for, for giving different uh, different types of, of links. In in reality, all the functions dealing with internal links in in my small edition are 400 lines of code. So. Yeah, it's not that simple after all. So let me give you another uh, example why, um, why data might be uh, more complex um, than you think, or you, you might just assume. Think about this um, um, FAQ um, section entry. This is not an actual screenshot, but uh, an English uh, translation for you. Um, yeah, it look, looks very, very simple. Um, how to quote this, this uh, edition, and then um, you see this. This, this recommendation and this, um, this uh, symbol here. And of course, an FAQ section belongs to the data. So um, I added a, um, a section within, within my data for all those uh, FAQ um, sections just with plain text. However, in this case, the data looks like such. So don't worry if you don't understand it. But the point is that um, the actual suggestion um, is not there. Instead, there is this, this very weird uh, TIAB um, element um, that you might wonder why this is the case. Well, if you think of a um, um, text snippet like this, um, you could, of course, um, copy and paste it whenever, whenever you need it. Um, but then you run into the problem that once um, the data changes, like maybe I will uh, update ne next year, um, next year another version, and then I have to to change the year, uh, or maybe the URL changes or whatever changes. So what what you want uh, usually is um, just one point on which uh, you define all those data, and then uh, just extracting it uh, from there. I think one, one general rule is. That you have, uh, if you copy and paste something within uh, within data, you're doing something wrong. 
basically. Well, and this is what, what I did here. Um, I picked those, those information from different parts of um, the document. I won't go in, into detail here. There are um, different, um, different um, yeah, elements for, for uh, almost everything in TI. Um, the point is that um, for uh, the actual URL, there is no element. I had to define it uh, in a separate file. So this, this comes from a, this is not TI. This is my, my own configuration file which are used here for the, um, for the URL. Well, and then um, I can show you that uh, all the, what, what, what happens with those odd uh, T, I, uh, A, B elements was um, whenever they are encountered, a special function is called. And what this function does is it picks the elements from different uh, spots uh, in the data. So on a more abstract level, what happens is that we have your data, again, this is complete nonsense, don't worry about the world. Um, the point is that within this, um, this text, at, at certain points, there are uh, references to the transformation. And uh, it works like such, whenever um, the, those um, special elements are uh, encountered, the transformation picks um, the, um, the information from different different, um, different um, places within the data. And from this, from this all, not just from, from the data, but from this uh, yeah, way up and way down, in the end, um, the presentation is um, created. So whenever they tell you it works like this, I can say, uh, say at least in my case, uh, it didn't work like this. So one. Um, Last example of uh, dealing with uh, data complexity is um, setting up a search. Well, um, when, when setting up a search, you, you can uh, just um, use um, the Google custom search and um, then you're done, basically. Um, however, I want to show you that uh, all also for, uh, even for um, so simple um, additions like mine, um, that's, that's not um, appropriate, I think. So first uh, of all, I think it's, it's important to define, um, to define what, what should be searchable and what not. And in my case, I decided that the main text, of course, the main Latin uh, source text, of course, should be searchable. Um, but those things here at the border, um, it does, doesn't make, make sense to, 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 to type uh, in a six and then you get um, this information that I don't think that would make any sense here. So I, I decided that all those things at the border are not searchable. So having that said, we we'll take a quick look at uh, what uh, Google does. If you type, for example, ET, then you get um, yeah, almost six uh, billion hits. Um, but what, what you don't uh, get is uh, um, yeah, an, an overview of, of your hits. You just, just get those as uh, yeah, almost plain text. And within, you get um, a text snippet like this. And um, yeah, sometimes this text snippet is helpful and uh, sometimes it isn't. Um, and this is why, um, oh no, this is because um, um, what Google does, it, it just takes text snippets um, from whatever part of, of, of a page. Um, when, when, you, when you search for, for something, just, just the surrounding characters of, of, of the, your, your search term and put it uh, together as, as, a, as a kind of a, of a text snippet. Uh, regarding, um, not regarding um, what, what the, yeah, so to say, the environment on the page is. However, I think that it's easy for, for just normal, normal plain text. However, if you think of um, something like tables, then I don't think what, what Google does, that makes any sense because if, if you have a text snippet from within a table cell, with, without seeing the table heading and the other rows and so on, you, you just can't understand uh, uh, what, what's there. And um, same goes for, for list items. You, you just, just can't, can't see what, what the list is, is about if you just have one, one text uh, snippet. And uh, of course, especially for, for quotations. If it's text within a text uh, and you just have a small text snippet, in, then you can't estimate what it's uh, all about. So what I did is um, I decided 
that whenever you search for a text um, uh, or for a word within the normal text snippet, then the complete paragraph, however long it might be, is put out. And uh, even more uh, uh, yeah, uh, excessive, so to say, is when, when you search um, for a word within, um, within a table, then the complete table is put out. That may makes the result page very large, but at least uh, uh, the user has a chance to see um, in which context um, a search term appears. And um, for um, quotations, I decided also to, to put out a complete quotation with a kind of a, yeah, the, the, the introduction sentence, um, so to say. This is yeah, one, one part of setting up a search. The other part I also um, already, um, already uh, hinted at it is um, that Google doesn't do any um, clear dis distinctions um, between categories um, of pages. However, um, in a critical edition, it makes a huge difference whether you, you found some, some search term in the source text, which was written 800 uh, years ago, or within the introduction, which was written last year. For an historian, that's, that's a huge uh, difference, you can imagine. Um, and this, this is why uh, you have to, to have a way to deal with the, certain, with the different categories of, um, of pages within a website. Google just doesn't care about it. So it's, it's always good, good to think about what Google uh, does good and what what are the, 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 yeah, the downsides of, um, of Google. So I, I decided as a scholar, I know which, um, which material is in, my, is in my website, and uh, of course the user should also uh, know it, and this is why if you search for ad, which is um, Latin for end, and uh, you get many, many uh, hits, but you get them in categories. You can you get uh, first, the down, down here, which, which, which I, what I cropped here is, is that you get the actual results, uh, what I have shown you just now, but for the path there is this, this kind of list with an, with an entry for each, uh, each yeah, kind of, of, uh, of text for each uh, category of page, and then you, you, you can see um, where actually um, your search term is found and um, where not. So, on a more um, abstract level again, but, but, uh, how uh, the search works is um, that you have um, different uh, elements in this, this, uh, regarding this, the search, uh, like text tables, list items, and so on, um, with, um, in different um, categories. Yeah, I mentioned it, like the source text, the introduction, and so on, and so on. And you have to, to decide about two things. First thing is, uh, for the categories, which uh, part to um, include in the search index, and uh, uh, which part uh, don't uh, to include, and decide how the different elements are to be displayed. Like I said, uh, the table is a complete table, and so on and so on. And from this you get um, results in categories with um, different uh, result entries. However, the, the point is, and this is uh, yeah, maybe kind of a, of a secret, that uh, by, by doing this, this design I encountered um, several problems. and. Um, I didn't just uh, change uh, the search whenever I encountered a problem, but sometimes I um, changed the um, um, original data. This is why I, I showed you this, this example to, to show you that a, a complex uh, search setup um, like this always um, forces you to rethink your data structure as well. So, so doing a, a search, which is part of the presentation level, and um, Doing, uh, doing your, your data and encoding um, is yeah mixed up, uh, or at least in my case it is it was very much uh, mixed up and um, and connected. So the interim uh, conclusion again is that there is no clear separation um, between data level and presentation level, and um, in my opinion the only way to deal with data complexity is know the data yourself. And now, of course, the, the intention of the presentation, now the techniques of transforming and of um, presenting. So, however, to now if you have, um, or I had something uh, like this, now a, a presentation and a site internal search, and now you know why this, those, those arrows are going in both directions, 
and uh, why those, those arrows here from, from the side internal search uh, are also going uh, in both um, directions. What I didn't uh, talk about here is um, the management of, of all those, those processes, but yeah, never mind. However, um, I think this is just the first uh, layer of uh, a digital humanities web application. This is why I call this, uh, um, this slide the different layers. Um, because your management software or whatever has to be um, installed and um, set up. And of course this management um, software has to run um, in a web server and this web server needs administration. That's the, the third level, so to say. And of course this web server runs in an admi um, operation um, system which needs um, administration um, Usually, um, a web server contains several um, virtual machines, which needs uh, um, administration. And uh, the most basic level is, of course, that the network, that your cables are connected, so to say, and the hardware. If your processor um, dies, then all those things die as well. So, um, in my opinion, these are the tasks of a humanist. And um, the other things are rather, um, sorry, that, that was one too, too fast, are more um, the tasks of um, technicians. However, I don't think there are, is a clear um, separation of, um, of the, the technicians, uh, the humanist task. This is why this, this is some yeah, kind of uh, fading here. Um, in my case, I had to do um, tasks to this, this level. Um, I will show you in a, in a second, just, just uh, briefly, what I uh, had to do. Um, I don't think this, this is a very uh, efficient uh, structure, but I just, just want, want to, to tell you that uh, you should be prepared that, that uh, setting up a digital edition or a digital um, web application uh, at all doesn't mean just you have to care about your data and the way to present your data, but you have to go some levels deeper, um, unfortunately, maybe. And in, in my case, that means um, that I had to, to care about these, these things. I won't go into detail here at all, but um, yeah, and honestly, I don't know the details uh, myself, but I had to, to care about it, and I had to, yeah, usually that, that means to, to, to Google things and put things uh, together you don't understand, but you have um, to be prepared um, to do it um, anyway. And also it means that it's not, not sufficient to, to write code in a, in a beautiful um, beautiful um, in environment, like, like an integrated development um, uh, environment, but you also have to write um, command line codes and, and stuff like this, which is uh, if you first, uh, or uh, it, um, when I encountered them, them first, I was like uh, shocked and I felt like back in the 80s, or uh, as I mentioned, the 80s, uh, uh, where, where like, um, however, it's still, it's still uh, done that way. And um, yeah, finally, that, that's, that's so to say the, the overkill. This is a script which uh, deletes the log files if they are too big. And this is, yeah, so to say, the combination of uh, command lines and coding uh, being a command line uh, coding. So um, yeah, in my opinion, this, this isn't the ta a genuine task of even a digital humanist. Um, but yeah, I had to do it. Uh, Anyway, and I just want, 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 want to show you what, what, what uh, lies uh, beneath, um, beneath setting up such a uh, web application. So, finally, the final uh, conclusion, which uh, won't surprise you, is um, that uh, I want to stress here at the end that it is, of course, good practice to separate, whenever possible, the data level from the presenting, uh, presentation level. However, that's not uh, in every case uh, possible, or at least in my case, I didn't find a way to do it, so I don't think it's always uh, possible um, to do so. Yeah, and the only way to deal with data complexity is know what to change. Change either the presentation or um, change, um, change the data um, itself. And um, yeah, as I just, just showed you uh, right now, um, in my case, I had to deal with, with several um, issues which are usually not, not considered uh, to be the tasks of, of humanists, but rather of uh, technicians, but yeah, I had to do it uh, anyway. So the, the conclusion is that in order to build a digital edition, yeah, you know, 
you have to know a lot. Thanks for your patience. <laughs>